Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, thank you for, for uh, coming from your various sessions. Don't, uh, don't be shy to pull up a chair from the edge if, uh, if you need to, so please do that. Uh, this is our, our last session of uh, the DigiFest this year, and it's our, our very final keynote speaker. And uh, Professor Shafi Ahmed, is, it's a real pleasure to, to have him here this afternoon. Uh, I've got a long list of all the wonderful things he does, and he's a, you know, he's a teacher, he's a futurist, he's an innovator, he's an entrepreneur, uh, but he's probably first and foremost uh, a really renowned and award-winning uh, surgeon who does extraordinary things. And uh, his big mission is to try to merge the education of medicine with global education uh, and to bring together those virtual and uh, augmented reality techniques uh, so that you know, surgical education around the world can be more accessible to more people more of the time and to make it uh, a democratic process. So it's a real privilege to, to have you here this afternoon. Thank you for coming, and the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks very much uh, for the introduction. It's very kind of you. Uh, thanks both Martin and the team from DigiFest for inviting me to give this uh, talk around education, around surgery, around medicine, and the kind of the future technology is going to impact all of our lives. So um, my day job, I'm a surgeon. I'm a cancer specialist working in London at the Royal London Hospital. Uh, in my spare time, I try to think about how do we make the world a bit better place using technology. I'll share my thoughts with you the last three to five years about the work that I've been doing and how to impact people on a global level. Um, first of all, introduction from where I work. This is St. Bartholomew's Hospital, based in London. We're a fairly young organization. We've been around for about 900 years as an organization in terms of hospital. So I put that picture up on purpose because obviously I have a number of roles. One of them is to teach. And I am an associate dean at our medical school, at Barts Medical School. And if you look at where we are now, 900 years, uh, we've come a long way in terms of what I call incremental growth, incremental medicine and changes, to now what's called exponential changes. And that's the kind of world that we live in and the world that you and I need to embrace uh, in healthcare and education. We've got a very much very famous alumni through these walls uh, of St. Bartholomew's. People like James Parkinson's, who discovered Parkinson's disease. Other famous surgeons who describe many ailments and treatment pathways for many, many conditions. So we have a history of innovation in my organization. But if we go back to surgery, now I am a kind of um, a cancer surgeon. I spend my time looking at patients on a daily basis, breaking bad news, treating ailments, treating their disease, and hopefully trying to overcome some of the issues around their care, hopefully trying to cure one or two people in our lifetime. If we go back to education and learning, of course, which is a fundamental part of who we are, let's go back to about 1,000 years. I'll put this picture up for a second, because when St. Bart's was being built in West Smithfield by a, a monk called Ray Here, who's placed the first kind of bricks into West Smithfield, at the same time, a man's walking around the southern Spain, Andalusia, and this was his name. He was Abu al Qasim. He was like the father of modern surgery. He wrote the first textbook of surgery, the written article, the written text, things that we've been taking for granted for many years. And interesting, his book that he wrote got um, then translated into Latin called the Liber Theorici. So the interesting thing about that, of course, this was written over a thousand years ago almost. But that became the single textbook of medicine and surgery about innovation, about techniques, for not one year, not for two years, but for 600 years. We had one textbook of innovation and learning. And this shows cases the kind of path that we've been through. It's the incremental changes. Nothing's changed for a long time until we get to the modern world. We look at the Gutenberg moment, the printing press. Despite that, there's still only one book of surgery that existed for hundreds of years. So that's kind of the prehistoric element of where we are. And I look at learning, and we'll talk about VR and AI in a moment, as a kind of continuum. We've come from ancient Egyptians, you know, papyrus, and before that, the stone tablets in the Stone Age. We've come a long way to books by the printing press, and now we're on to e-learning online platforms, and now we're exploring the world of AR, VR, AI, robotics. This is just a continuum. We've got to figure out how we create learning that's compelling, that's useful, and that's going to uh, be the way that we teach the next generation of not just doctors, but everybody around the world using these technologies. As a teacher, I've often thought about my own specialty. I became a surgeon because I wanted to be the man in this picture, 
the man who, at centre of stage, who commanded respect for everybody around that hall together, demonstrating some anatomy or some surgery. It was an important uh, picture, if you like. People from the top in this big hall, and we call the operating theatre an operating theatre, because theatre is where we kind of do operations and we train and teach in this kind of setup. So I've looked at that picture for a long while, thinking, OK, that's great. This is what we've been doing for a long time. Where's the learning? As a surgeon, we've assumed this is the way we teach people in the past. And it's great, yeah, it's great pictures and that kind of thing. If we fast forward that same picture to modern day, what do we see? We see this. So now we've assumed as surgeons that this is a great way of learning. Just by being in the vicinity of greatness, the surgeon, you somehow acquire some knowledge. And I'd argue, of course, that knowledge is acquired by two things. It's diffusion and osmosis. There's no active learning. Our medical students, our trainees, spend a lot of money and effort and time to be taught the art of surgical practice. I'm not sure what they're learning here, of course, apart from the fact that they're testing out the support structure of the ceiling for those are ceiling lights. But this is reality. We still think this is the way to teach people. So I thought about that a long time, thinking we need to change and evolve and move on to much more modern ways of teaching. After all, our students pay 9,500 tuition fees per year for the privilege of being somewhere in that melee. And it's not really effective learning or use of money at all. Karl Schwab, who's the World Economic Fair, uh, Chairman, about two and a half years ago, made the whole comment around we're now embracing what's called the fourth industrial revolution. He talked about this merging of technologies together that blur the lines between the physical, the digital, and the biological spheres. And it's exciting, because medicine itself, at the moment, it's the most exciting time to be alive, ever, as a doctor, in medicine. We've gone through so many changes, but now, all these technologies together, whether it's blockchain, AI, robotics, whether it's wearables and sensors of big data, and AI and VR, all those kind of things now, are coming together for the first time. We've never had such riches of technology, which can impact not just education, patient health care. Your lives will change immeasurably in the next two, five, ten years. You'll be treated differently. You'll be using technology to interface your health care. So if you look at all these things, the question is, how does that also impact education? Well, it does. If you look at the orange bits, the AI, the robotics, and the big data, that's going to be really important in defining future education and learning. And the implementation will be around VR and AR. So suddenly, these technologies will impact all of us in a way that we've never thought possible before. And we are certainly in a kind of place where we'd like to be for the next two to five years. The other thing I talk about is the whole thing around exponential growth and changes. Now, we know the computers are changing power. We know the computing power every 18 months to a year now is doubling in capacity. But we need to change your mindsets, first and foremost. Our mindsets as human beings on this planet are very much linear. We have linear expressions, linear growth. We understand how linear works. If I give you an example, for, an example, for example, if you think about taking 30 linear steps, if I walk today from here and I walk in that direction to DigiLab, I walk 30 steps, linear steps. You know where I'm going to be. I'm going to be somewhere in the meta kind of angle in the corner over there. If I tell you I now take 30 exponential steps, the way that technology is going to impact us in the future, how far do you think I'd get to? Would I get to the sofas behind the stage? I'd have gone around the planet 26 times. That's the kind of pace of change that you kind of got to get used to. That's what's happening as we speak. No longer is it viable to think in linear steps. Otherwise, you'll be left well far behind, and you'll become obsolete before you know it. So your mindset has to change and evolve, and healthcare itself has to move on in that way. Healthcare itself can be a bit slow. Obviously, it's patient safety, it's outcomes. We are traditionally very slow learners. However, we've got to challenge some of that. My question to my healthcare colleagues, often around the world, and I am faculty at Singularity University in the US, I talk about the whole fact that you've got to challenge the dogma and tradition. We're stuck with this kind of area for many, many years. Like the picture I showed you, the way we teach people in the OR, it's been like that hundreds of years, but I want to challenge it because it's what we do. But my question to everybody in the room and doctors around the world is, if you don't challenge it on a daily basis, by definition, you're accepting mediocrity. So I ask you in the audience, how many of you want to be mediocre, put your hands up? Nobody. We don't want to, so therefore, everything's got to be challenged. 
every pathway, every day, you think about, okay, what's different? How do I evolve it? How do I change it? And healthcare needs that kind of thought process, make sure that we evolve in the right way. Many years ago, when I qualified um, uh, from medical school, we all took what's called the Hippocratic Oath, the oath of pledge, if you like, the oath to make sure that we're professional, that we look after our patients ethically, morally, we do the right thing for them. That's been translated now into the Declaration of the Human, uh, the Geneva Convention, as opposed to the original Hippocratic Oath that we took many years ago. So we look at that, and we look at the way we've been looking after our patients for a long time. And you see, on the left-hand side, the kind of paternalistic way we look after our patients. It's the hand-holding. It's the touch. It's the kind of eye contact. It's kind of the way we break bad news. We consult. We measure the outcome. And we're all used to that. We're used to that kind of way of seeing our GP, our specialist. But actually, that's all changing because of technology. I'll talk to you about the whole area around the doctor-patient relationship and also how that will impact the educational commitments that we have to our trainees. Let's go back to real futurists, 1924. These are futurists from 1924. They're thinking about a different way of connecting the radio doctor, telemedicine, already thinking about it 100 years ago. Not now. They think, actually, we've got to get away from that doctor-patient relationship, the human touch, whatever we decide to do. It's going to be how do we connect people in a way that we haven't done before. So they talk about radio waves and about how to connect people in a different way using television screens and everything. That's all relevant, way beyond their times. In fact, where we are now is the one-click generation. We are the one-click generation. This is interesting. We want a pizza with one click, just eat. Amazon, we want a one-click book, right? We get upset if Uber doesn't come in three minutes. If it's five minutes, we get really upset. Where has, where has it gone? But for healthcare, we wait two or three weeks. We click, we say, wait, where's the appointment? It's fine. We've got it wrong. In some ways, healthcare is more urgent, it's important. But yeah, we're not prepared to work, we're, we're prepared to pay for healthcare, but not for our pizza or our taxi, wherever it is. So now we're changing. Companies now are producing software and apps and telemedicine. We can click one access. Doctor will come up immediately around the world, give you a diagnosis, etc. The whole interface will change in terms of that doctor patient relationship that we thought about earlier as being sacrosanct. And these are the kind of things happening as we speak. If that's the kind of future we're looking forward to, how do we create the doctors of tomorrow? One of the things I've been challenged by a lot is medical school hasn't changed for hundreds of years. We're still teaching anatomy, physiology, biochemistry. It's still a five-year program. It's still some clinical sciences. The future doctors of tomorrow are different, OK? You can call them millennials, Generation X, wherever it is. They need to be different. They need to be more flexible. They need to be entrepreneurial. Healthcare needs to evolve because our healthcare system is broken. So we need people now who are young, who are thinking outside the box of how to deliver healthcare in a different way. There's no more money in the world. We're all bankrupt. So therefore, we've got to use existing money and technology to make healthcare more efficient. So therefore, it's incumbent upon people like me to make those changes to new doctors. So what I did in my medical school, we ran the first program ever in the world uh, called Bart Sex Medicine. And my students last year, as a pilot, were taught not by anatomists, not by physiologists or biochemists or any one of those. They were taught by coders, developers, app designers, creative thinkers. They were taught by venture capitalists, crowdsource funders. They were taught by the future technology guys from all around the world, from Harvard, from Singularity in California, from New York, saying, this is what you've got to think about. Let's give you the skill sets to become the future, what I call the digital doctors or the connected doctor. We've got to retrain people. We can't accept the way they're trained at the moment. They went away, these groups of students who I taught, to find some ideas to change healthcare, to impact. Could be an app, could be design of a pathway. They were mentored by people in the tech industry, major companies, saying, look, here's your idea. Let's see how we make it work. How do we impact people uh, around your ideas? To show them the success and failure, to accept they need to change healthcare. And we had the first winners last year of the first entrepreneurs at medical school. And now, this year, the entire year are taught by the same people. It's the first medical school in the world that's got technology, innovation, entrepreneurship embedded into curriculum. 
because that's the kind of people we want to train in the future. Your doctors need to be much more flexible in the way they deliver health care. So this is what I think the future will be. I think all doctors at some point will be trained in a similar fashion as time goes on. My other talk around all of this is about being connected. And we are connected here, of course. Yeah, we've even got Edurome here, I'm told. Well done to the team for DigiFest bringing it here. But I'm just saying that it's about the world. I call myself a global citizen. It's no good to think about UK and become UK-centric. It's about how do you impact people around the world, given you, where you are at the moment. It's about being connected. We're being helped, of course. We're now putting cables from North America all the way to, uh, uh, to Europe, to Portugal. Big, heavy cable under the North Atlantic. Because we have a thirst for connectivity, for 3G, for 4G, for 5G now. We want access to computers and internet. Therefore, we're now being helped by major companies like Microsoft and Facebook. We're also helped by Google. Project Lune, you've seen this, when they had the Puerto Rico hurricanes. They're now putting balloons into the cloud, which give access to high-speed Wi-Fi to parts of the globe that need it. Yes, and this is balloons in the cloud that will give us that connection that we require and we want to cherish. What about Facebook? Project Aquila. It's a drone at 70,000 feet it flies with a wingspan of 737 based on solar panels and solar travel. That's also giving access to Wi-Fi to parts of Africa, parts of Asia. Suddenly, we are being connected. Smartphones have become more ubiquitous. By 2020, two-thirds of the population around the world will have access to a smartphone. Suddenly, we're connected. We have smartphones, etc. Only a few days ago, the first few satellites put in space by Elon Musk they're called Tintin A and Tintin B, for want of better terms. But he wants to create a network of satellites around the globe that are cheap, 10 to 50 at a time by the new um, uh, SpaceX, and suddenly we'll be even more connected, not at space level, but also at a level much below that. Suddenly, we are going to be more and more connected. So therefore, our learning and education can take place in a different way that people haven't thought about before. The other thing about on a global level is my own specialty. We've been obsessed with different areas of medical problems around the world. We have our own one in surgery. About three years ago, the Lancet Commission produced this report. For the first time, it quantified a problem about surgery. It estimated that two-thirds of the population, that's five billion people, don't have access to safe surgery. Now, you might think, living in the UK, that's ridiculous. How can that be? How do we make that much better? So, to overcome some of the inequalities of healthcare, and in my case, surgery, we need to train two million more people today to be able to do operations on a global level. These are not fancy robotic operations. These are operations like appendix operations, cesarean sections, management of fractures, things that will change outcomes, improve mortality, and improve morbidity. It's about doing the right thing. To do that, we have to provide the resources to perform 150 million operations per year. So there's this challenge. Global challenge. So the question for you guys is, what do we do? How do we overcome some of the issues around inequalities? And for all of us, we want to leave a legacy. We want to make sure the world that we live in has some kind of fairness attached to it. And how do we then create that system that's better? We agree with the fundamental principle that education is a fundamental human right. We all agree in this room. Yes, you are not in approval. But then you all agree with that fallacy. It's a fallacy. Because education depends on two things on resource and location. Simple, where you're born, how much money you have. It doesn't transcend otherwise. We assume it's free, it's not. So we've got to use technology to satisfy the criterion that what we believe in is going to be free education, or at least accessible to everyone in the world. When AR and VR came out a while ago, it became big news. It's going to be a big industry in the future. It's estimated to be probably worth many, many billions by 2020, if not already. And now we're suddenly moving to the momentum's changing because we now find compelling use cases uh, for AR and VR. And actually, it's becoming more complex as we speak. It started a few years ago when Palmer Lucky, who was a young man who was about 17 years of age at the time, reinvented virtual reality. It's been there for a long time in the past. It's just computing power now is strong enough or powerful enough to make VR more compelling. So he did a Kickstarter a few years ago, wanted to raise a few thousand pounds, end up raising over 2.4 million US dollars. Suddenly, it changed. Palmer Lucky sold that company to um, Facebook, Oculus, for 2.1 billion at the age of 21. Not bad 
if you can get it, right? But it's not about the actual product. It was the thought around ARVR concept that he was selling. And actually, this is what's been going on over the last few years. This year, we've seen a plethora of headsets coming out. There's the cardboards, there's the tether devices, which have been powerful but attached to a computer. Now they're moving on to a mobile platform onto your head. Suddenly, it's becoming cheaper, more affordable. The headsets are more better, they don't have the lag, they don't make you nausea. Suddenly, we're changing the paradigm that we were in before. And all these headsets are coming out as we speak, if not more. Augmented reality is the other one. So virtual reality is where you put your headset on and you're immersed in the world that you can't see. AR, augmented reality, is where you have uh, glasses, which overlays information in front of you. And these are some of the glasses that have been coming out from various places that I've used over the last few years. And all of you, at some point, will be using them. Sooner or later, and I make that prediction to you in front of you, of course, is that you will have a smartphone. Yes? So within two to five years, maybe the ten years, that smartphone will disappear. It won't be in your hand anymore. All of you will be having glass headsets. Your phone will be on your head. It makes sense. You're using your hands unnecessarily. Waste of time. Why not talk to it, voice technology? Why not use AI? Why not talk to things and do things? Actually, it was free up your hands, do something else. So smartphones will change, and these kind of technologies now, but all of you will be wearing them. They'll be smaller, much more sleeker. There'll be retinal scanning, etc. Suddenly, your smartphone kind of interface will change. Believe me, it's going to happen. Also, we're going to be helped by the major companies. Everyone has an Android and Apple phone. So uh, Apple released their own kind of AR kit, and Android now have got the AR core. So suddenly all your mobile phones will have power, be powered by augmented reality. So suddenly the ch it's all changing this year about the access to this kind of technology. This mysterious company called Magic Leap have only just come out. They've been around for five years, and they've just raised another half a billion. They've raised 2.5 billion now, and no one knows what they do. Google throw money at it. Alibaba throw money at it. Finally, they've come out with something this year called Magic Leap 1. It's mixed reality. It's going to be amazing. And people are now throwing money at this organization and this company. Okay? We're hoping it will deliver. <laughs> After 2.5 billion, we're all hoping it will deliver. Otherwise, we're all out of business. Okay? So this is the kind of thing that will be coming out this year, which is really fascinating. And will, again, move us forward by a long shot. So putting all that together, the connectedness, the technology, how do I use that to impact what I do for a living? So the Google Glass came out a few years ago. I was one of the early glass explorers. And I thought, can I teach people in a way using wearable tech, simple smartphone on your head kind of thing, kind of stream and operation live? So what I did on that day, we decided to use Google Glass uh, we'll see, to live stream. That's me operating using Google Glass. It's a really light device, sits on your head. We reconfigured it with some software. We allowed myself to stream it through my eyes kind of point of view approach. People around the world on their smartphones could watch the operation through my eyes. They could interact with me by simply putting a text message onto their smartphone, which would appear on the glass as I was operating. I could answer them real time, speak to them, and see what I can teach them on a global scale. On that day when we did the operation, um, it's, I taught about 14,000 people in 118 countries just by simple access to technology using a streaming device. Okay? Suddenly, it's about N equals many. I want you to go away thinking about how you leave impact and legacy. Not thinking about n equals one or n equals two. Think about n equals many. At the end of the day, would you like to share your knowledge with thousands of people rather than just a few people around you? Isn't that the kind of legacy we want to leave behind? So with this technology, you can. We created a whole platform using wearable tech a few years ago, using wearable tech like this, where you can see operations live in real time, interact with chat box around the world, where you can suddenly connect on a peer-to-peer -peer network. So it's a new way of teaching a learning environment using wearable tech in a way that hasn't been done before. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to teach this man how to do a simple procedure um, remotely. Anybody know who this is? No, yeah, I think you probably do know who he is. This is John Scully. John Scully was the CEO of Pepsi Cola before Steve Jobs brought him to Apple to become the CEO. He's the guy who sacked Steve Jobs in the film that you've seen, okay? He created the world's most powerful company. I taught him how to do a simple operation using wearable tech. He has a mobile phone company. He wants to impact the world with his mobile technology. And actually, it made sense to see whether we could connect together to do a simple thing. A 70-year-old man did a simple procedure after five minutes very well. It didn't take long to teach him how to operate. And that's the kind of thing, it's interesting, how we can use this technology to impact. The whole world of surgery is changing. We're going to be teaching remotely. 
we don't have to be in the same position. We can use all these devices now using AI interfaces and kind of uh, TV screens, etc., using iPads, mobile devices, and smartphones. And I can teach people now in a way that we haven't done before. I often do live operations like this now. I look pretty peculiar, uh, dressed up in all these kind of um, stuff. This is me using a Vuzix 3000 uh, wearable tech, streaming to my audience on a global level using devices like this. And I can teach people in a way that I hadn't taught before. And this is me teaching my own trainee remotely. Anthony, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good. So, have you ligated the vessel? Yeah, I've taken the vessel. What's next? Red circle, big no no. There we are. Okay. And then we save that. So you don't need to be in the same room anymore. You can be remotely teaching people on a global level. And this is the kind of thing we've been uh, working on. Was the? Oh, here we go. VR itself now, if you look at VR in therapeutics, uh, it's now showing its true worth. It's showing in clinical ap applications and clinical trials to be useful in treatment of phobias and anxieties and that kind of thing. So already we're seeing great impact in the therapeutic VR. Also, it's been used by the American military for treatment of post-traumatic stress disorders. So when they come back from war-torn zones, they're placed in VR kind of interface for a while to overcome some of the burden. And the Canadian military are doing much the same thing. But especially for surgery, it's been shown now that we can reduce pain by distractive therapy using immersion in VR. Suddenly, you might find that you prescribed not just analgesia, painkillers, you'd be prescribed VR to overcome some of the pain that you might have after the procedures. Suddenly, things are changing. In surgery, we're now hopefully going to be able to planning procedures before you go into the OR with overlays of CT scans, MRIs, images, so that you can plan the operation in a way that hasn't been done before uh, or possible in, the, in that sense. We can also train. We can do simulation in that area now, placing tibial nails and using medical devices so that we change the way of simulation in this area. We can use it for simple things like overlaying anatomy and information that will help us in the future in terms of learning and education. Simple things. This is the most useful device ever to actually find veins, right? All my junior doctors, you've seen them every day when they first start working. On April, August the 1st, they change over. August the 1st is black, black day for all of us, right? The new doctors are jabbing people left, right, and center, <laughs> finding vessels and veins. You've all been there, right? Suddenly, their lives will be transformed. There will be no so much injuries anymore, and we can find veins quite easy now using AR. We can, over, we can put in MRI and CTs overlaying information, so you can plan needless and operations in real time uh, over a patient's body. And that's going to be a much better way of being much more precise in surgery. I do a lot of work on a global level. I visit many, many countries teaching and training. I do many philanthropic work in many war-torn zones. I feel that I spend a lot of time in Gaza in a place that's difficult to get to because I think that we can somehow overcome some of the geopolitical problems we cause ourselves just by being human and overcome them with technology because we can overcome the barriers that we create by teaching people and training people remotely that you can't get to, whether it's in Iraq or Syria or your refugees. Suddenly, the world becomes more connected in this way. So I think really it's much more than just about the technologies, how to impact global healthcare in a way that you've never done before. Now you're wondering, what on earth am I putting social media up on stage here for? Um, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and kind of Twitter. Now, yes, I have a confession to make. I'm addicted to all of these things, uh, much like everybody else. I'm probably too old to use some of these, I guess, right? Um, but the reason why I'm showing this is because actually it's hugely impactful. Facebook has 2 billion users on a daily basis. A third of the population of the world is on Facebook on a daily basis. Instagram has about 300 million users. Twitter, similar. Snapchat, about 200 million users. Snapchat's interesting. 75% of the users of Snapchat are between the ages of 17 and 25. Much younger than I. Much younger than the audience, probably. So you're probably thinking, why am I showing all this? It's relevant. It's about impact. It's about free software being available. Remember, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook are the most powerful AR platforms there are in the world at the moment. We don't think about it. We do selfies and adding pictures. That's all AR. 
So I, used, I was impacting. I thought, let's use that to train people. This was me in Bangladesh about a year ago. <laughs> One click on Facebook Live. Suddenly 10,000 surgeons around in Southeast Asia are connected, being taught. You don't need to create your own platform. It's there already. Let's not take pictures of our dogs, our cats, our food. Let's think about doing something different, more enabling, like this. Snapchat was interesting. I managed to get one of the spectacles. I'm not sure you've seen these, little spectacles that allow you to record in 10-second clips. And I thought, can I teach my students? Because my students, remember, are between the age of 17 and 25, the same age group as Snapchat appeals to. So I thought, let's see, let's play around with this. Let's design an operation in 10-second clips, use Snapchat, push it to my story on social media. Let's take the risk and figure out where it stands. Let's see what the engagement's going to be like. Can I teach people on that level? And interestingly, we did this first operation using Snapchat. It was a simple hernia operation, an so, but I pushed live to my story. And live onto my story. So this is the anatomy, anterior superior spine, symphysis pubis, pubic tubercle, and the inguinal canal. It went viral. It got me onto Time magazine and everywhere around the world covered the story, thinking, hey, this guy's crazy, he's wearing Snapchat spectacles, but he's teaching. I've been fortunate in my life. I've been in virtually every TV magazine, etc. programme. The one that I'm most proud of still and surprised by this day is the next one. Okay, and do you know what it is? I was actually in Cosmopolitan. <laughs> Can you believe how disruptive that might be? As between the kind of lingerie section and the shoes, there's a picture of me and my operation. I'm really out of place in the world that we live in. But they clearly felt it was impactful for their audience, which I still struggle with to this day. I also, interestingly, have famous uh, Hollywood A-list of friends. Ashton Kutcher put me on his Facebook wall, and so my kids at home now think I'm cool daddy because Ashton Kutcher thinks I'm OK. But actually, what it showed was impact. This was simple technology, simple platform, AR, Snapchat. It had 2 million views of a single operation. We had 100,000 downloads on YouTube within 24 hours. And actually, every time I operate now, on Snapchat, I push it out, I have 5,000 students around the world who suddenly interact with me, young people, thanking me, saying, look, thanks for sharing what you do in that way. We looked at the, this is the kind of things I get every time I operate, simple things using social media. OK, we looked at the impact of the operation within one month of people tweeting, retweeting, kind of getting involved in that one operation. And in one month, guess how many people were tweeting, retweeting the operation? It was 56 million people. The impact just of simple technology like this, thinking, OK, how do we talk to people in the way they want to be talked to? It's not us. It's not about 20, 30 years ago. It's changing. They want a different way, different models of learning. So this is the kind of impact that we had. I'll share this with you. The other day, I was doing the operation a few months ago. I said to my audience, who are you, where are you watching it from? Because I don't know, because you don't get that information. They came back saying, hi, I'm from here and wherever. One girl called Ella said, hi, my name's Ella. I'm a third year medical student. Um, thank you very much. I'm being taught by you. I'm a third year medical student on the Marianas Islands. I said, where the hell is that? I Google Earthed it. I kept had to zoom into the Pacific Ocean. And finally, I found that an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean of 12,500 people. And she was watching it from there, being taught, and I was connected with her. Isn't that powerful? The way we can connect with people in a way that you never imagined before? By thinking outside the box, thinking, how do we connect with people? Not content with that, I was lucky enough to be the NHS Twitter account holder uh, about uh, a year ago. And I thought I used that opportunity to teach people and the public about surgery, about the NHS, using tweets. So we did the world's first operation using 140 characters or less, thinking, how do I engage people using Twitter? And we did this. And you can see the whole moment on NHS Twitter later on. It's about four or five minutes long, so we'll move on. But please do feel free to watch that. 
a million people were connected with that. They suddenly felt that, hey, thank you for sharing on Twitter about what you're doing. It's more about the work of the NHS. It's about who we are, creating safety environments for the patients. It wasn't about the operation. It was showcasing who we are, because I think we've been covered in mystique for a long time. Surgeons have this mask on their face. We hide in the operating theatre. It's mystical. No one knows what we do. Actually, we need to be more transparent. We own a human. We have a work that we do. And I want to make sure that we're more open and transparent to the part that we, we serve. We talked a bit about telemedicine being remote. This is the whole Snapchat and the kind of telemedicine angle. What about if you bring people from somewhere else close to you in virtual reality so they can be in the same OR with you? So what I did a year ago, uh, we decided the world's first VR operation. We used a camera rig. We created ourselves to record an operation in virtual reality. We then um, we created our own organization, but South the biggest organization in the UK, with every headset. A little Google Cardboard, whether you're a porter, you're a plumber, whether you're a nurse or whatever you were, we gave you a little headset, we gave you a free app to download uh, the kind of uh, live operation, and suddenly we engaged. And we did the world's first operation in that sense, um, and it went viral, what, by 55,000 people. In real time, I was teaching and training around the world in, 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 in just that one operation. And actually, again, suddenly, rather than being remote, you're being right next to somebody in the operating theatre with you. You could be anywhere in the world. You could be in the middle of Africa or Asia. But actually, you could be suddenly be trained by somebody in the UK or, for example, in the US. This visit to camera rig allows immersion. People around the world using a low-cost technology, a simple VR headset, to actually immerse themselves in operating theatre around the world. So we're moving on now. VR's changing. We're going to evolve in haptic feedback. We're coming. We're going to get photo real images, photo gametry. Suddenly, the world of VR will be a different place because we're going to replace the whole kind of virtual learning environment that we've created using all these kind of devices that are slowly <coughs> developed as we speak, and we get better and better recreating the human touch and feel in that environment. My own team in medical realities, we um, uh, created the world's first virtual reality training platform, which came out six months ago. And the second iteration came out in December. And this is the kind of thing that we're trying to create new learning in VR. download it, play around with it, tell me what you think. The whole of learning will change because of all these technologies. And being a medical student is going to be really exciting because of this. So all this is very exciting, and that's why I'm saying to you it's going to be the way we change. But all that is going to produce a lot of big data. So big data is this big kind of term that people use, because when we're doing these kind of things now, we have big data being produced. And this whole thing now points to the world of AI, or intelligence augmented. So we're going to figure out now what, how that data will improve outcomes, improve education, etc. We all know already um, that AI is big. Already, you know, we've looked at IBM Watson and Google DeepMind, Computers are now becoming much more, more powerful as we speak. Already they beat the world chess champion and the Jeopardy champion and recently AlphaGo. So already we're now moving to the area where AI is becoming more complex. 
uh, it's more sophisticated, and it's going to replace a lot of the jobs that we do already in healthcare and other places. And so this is interesting. Take about the one-click generation, of course. And I think voice technology is going to be vitally important in the future. Imagine if you could just talk to Alexa in the operating theatre, or um, the Google Home, for example, asking questions, it being intelligent enough to recognise your voice and giving advice in real time. Voice tech is going to be the key, and Amazon already, remember, have got a whole company called 1482, the same year that Columbus discovered America, to look at health tech in the future. So all the major players now will be working on AI interface using voice tech. Your first point of contact in medicine within two to five years will not be a human being. It will be an AI machine, it will be a chat bot. It will be, won't be human. It will be intelligent. It will have lots of information out there. And medicine will change immeasurably with these technologies. Already, we've got things in the pocket, chatbots, you'll ask questions. It analyzes your answers using data acquired through uh, clinical notes. And they give you a diagnosis and a prescription to pick up. That will take care of 95% of the workload for doctors, OK? It's changing. And already, you can access this already in London uh, instead of a GP. I often talk about the future, and very soon, by 2022, we've been promised to be an interplanetary species. We're going to Mars. Yes, we're going, whether we like it or not. We're going to be kicking and screaming, but we're going to go, right? Because it's where we're going to salvage mankind, so they tell us. Already we saw that you can get a Tesla and drive to Mars. Of course you can. And actually, it's interesting, because that's where the future's lying. Because we're going to think about how in the future are we going to be interplanetary species. My question for you, if we do go on that ship to Mars and someone has a problem medically, how are we going to treat them? Have we thought about it in terms of healthcare? Well, actually, interestingly, what we're going to do in colonising another country, we're going to use 3D printing. We're going to create our own pills and create our own devices, our own instruments to just transport them across the world and into another world, okay, to be able to create things like this, for example. And you might think that's kind of far-fetched, but only a few years ago, 18 months ago, Made in space, they put the first 3D printer into the International Space Station. One of the astronauts damaged his thumb. He needed a splint. And NASA sent a PDF file. They recreated that splint in the space station, put it on, he was OK. It's the way we're going to design healthcare in space because we don't have the resources to take everything with us. So 3D printing will go better. We'll be able to replace hearts, kidneys soon, skin. Sooner or later, we won't need donors. We'll be transplanting things that are made from scratch using 3D printing. And that's where we're going to make healthcare much more, um, much better. And this guy here has promised us every year transplant a head onto a body, we're waiting for the outcome of that. I also don't need to be anywhere. I can be anywhere looking after my patients. This is me in my own operating theatre, being remote using beam telepresence, or in fact seeing my patients using the systems. Walking in, I can be anywhere. Why do you have to be physically in one place to do something? That's like inefficient use of time and energy. You can do this. You can talk to your people being remote on a smartphone anywhere around the world. Of course you can. And actually, one of my things I've been thinking about a long time is about how do I transport myself? I talked about telemedicine being remote. We talked about VR coming close to you. What about if you transport yourself to another part of the world without traveling? This has been the kind of mission I've been on for a while. So we decided to create the, my, this was the world's first virtual surgery. This is me being recorded by 104 cameras by a process called photogametry. I know it's a rather elaborate kind of selfie. However, <laughs> and yes, they struggled to get my good side, as I, I kept saying. But what they created was the world's first virtual surgeon. That's me. That is me, virtually. Volume. It has depth. Proper depth that I lack. And then also, it will have intelligence. It will be based on intelligence around the world. All the information that Google can throw at it, it will be far better than me. It can train people in a different way. We're going to get away from the human interface and think about how other things can teach and train people in a way that was done before, on a global scale, scaling up. So I thought, what do I do with this? This is me with the HoloLens on. I thought, can I use this technology about transporting myself somewhere and doing something? Can I connect with people in three time zones, in three continents, in my OR, in the same time? Maybe. So we have now going to enter the virtual space with my colleagues from around the world to discuss a case uh, which is going on behind me in theatres, get some real-time advice about the case. Mm. So um, we'd like to uh, introduce you to the people from around the world. So in front of me, um, tell me about yourself and who are you, where are you watching from? Hey, this is Ian. Uh, I'm here in, in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. I'm one of the creators of Thrive. Pleasure to be here today. Thank you for joining us from the US. Um, Shailash. Hi, this is Professor Shailesh Srikande. I'm the chief of GI and HPV cancer surgery at the Tata Memorial in Mumbai in India. 
Thank you very much for joining us on this special occasion. And Hitesh Patel. Hi, I'm Hitesh Patel. I'm a consultant colorectal surgeon, and I'm joining you from the London Independent Hospital. So we have four people in four different places across three continents trying to connect together to discuss a case in real time. This is going to change the way we sort of manage our patients and also how we train and teach in the future. And we'll see, uh, I'll give you a quick discussion. This is a patient who is just over 80 years of age who presented with anemia and was found to have a lesion uh, in the sort of right colon on colonoscopy. And we can see the summary of the findings on our screen in front of us, for example. So what I'm going to do now is just take out the, uh, the models we've got here. That's the pelvic model. We're going to get the scans all out here. And then we're just going to just move up to the next scan here and also the endoscopy report. So um, Professor Shailash, would you mind just talk to me about the case and what your thoughts are about how we should manage this patient? Sure. To me, this looks uh, like a lesion in the right colon if I see the CT scan image, but of course I also see the colonoscopy image now. So we can connect in real time in various parts of the world using various systems. My colleagues and friends over there from Double Me are doing some amazing things with real life holoportation. This is my kind of Princess Leia moment where I'm looking for help from Obi-Wan Kenobi. But that's been created by a team over there saying actually maybe we can project you properly in real time. And actually, what about if you suddenly project yourself? Someone needs some help in some part of the world. You project yourself, you look over their shoulder, you give them a hand, tell them what to do, and you disappear. Isn't that the, what we need to be doing in the future about how we transport ourselves in a way that we haven't been done before? Robotics is big. Uh, the whole of the world of surgical robotics is rapidly expanding. Eight and nine robots coming out in the next two years. So this is going to be interesting because they become much more, more sophisticated. All of you at some stage now will be operated by robots in due course, assisted by human beings. What about if robots suddenly became autonomous? Would you trust a robot to do your operation autonomously? You may think, well, I'm not ready for that. But also, we're ready already for taxis to be autonomous. You can, create, you can hail a taxi in Pittsburgh using your smartphone. It will come to you by Uber. There'll be no driver. It drives you and drops you off and carries on. Already, we're going to be challenging autonomous working. And actually, Uber is going to ask all the right questions for us, ethically and morally, about how we manage this autonomous nature. And already, we've got the first autonomous surgeon being able to join bits about together, which we never thought was possible only a few years ago. So already, we're moving on quite rapidly. What about... I well, talked about being empathic and actually get the hand touching and control. What about robotics? We've got a little robot over there I was playing around with earlier. What about Sophia? How many people have seen Sophia before? Sophia is the empathic robot, the one that's going to be empathised to all of us. Maybe the way we change things in the future. Always lived in a laboratory in Hong Kong at Hanson Robotics. Where would you like to travel to? I love to visit new places. What was the last place you visited? Probably nothing. Did you enjoy your last place that you visited? My job is to be full of lies and compassionate artificial intelligence and ideas. What do you do? Mm -hmm. All you have to do to talk to a handsome robot is just talk. We can understand text and speech. Donald Trump. So tell me, do you have any voice the question. <laughs> question. That's very pissed I love that. Anyway, it's been lovely to meet you, Sophia. So, please, okay. you now, you while, I'm really I shall say goodbye to you. It's been my absolute pleasure to meet you. I'm living, I'm listening. Social So, would you be prepared to be treated by a chatbot, AI? Can you learn from these people? Will you be happy in the future? It's going to happen, whether you like it or not. We have to adjust our kind of uh, expectations about healthcare and their future. So last slide really is about my patients. When I do this innovation work, we forget we're in isolation, we're not. 
It's about our patients being the most important part of that journey. These are the kind of patients who don't mind being showcased on a, level, on a worldwide stage to help teach people on a global level. And so obviously, my kind of work is always dedicated to those people who take most of the risks on my behalf in trying to strive for innovation. Uh, thank you very much. Shafi, Shafi, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we, we are a little bit short of time, but um, Shafi's uh, been kind enough to say he'll answer a couple of questions if you've got them bef before we go. We have some, uh, some folk with some microphones, so if you're interested in having a quick question on that fascinating talk, please put your hand up. Excuse my voice. In that case, Stand. I'm going to take the clicker back from me, if I may, because... Uh, just uh, one last chance to, to, to thank Shafi for his really fascinating chat. Thank, thank you. And uh, it's, it's really my, my job to, to thank you all for coming for the last couple of days. Hope you had a wonderful time. We've had some great speakers and some great, uh, some great sessions. And uh, you've been kind enough to say some nice things on social media. Sometimes it appears, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and... Uh, I just want to say, oh, it's, our, it's our great leader with, uh, with his biggest fan at the, at the opening session. And uh, Shakira was, was, a, was a great opening speaker, and we were uh, thrilled to have her. And we were absolutely thrilled to do the, the Lola uh, session, which uh, seemed to go down pretty well. It was a pretty amazing thing, I think. I want to say thank you to our sponsors. You can see here, Microsoft, ProQuest, uh, MyDay, and Tribal, because we're, without them, clearly, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this. And in a moment, if I... Well, it's not going to do that for me, but it's not going to do it. It's given up. It's been too long. It's been a tough couple of days. <laughs> but uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you had a really good time. Safe trip home. And uh, 13th of March next year, so put it in your diary, and we'll see you again. Safe journeys home.